Shalom, good evening, Hans the Garden Suburb Synagogue. I'm here tonight with Rabbi Guttentag. Hello. Okay, tonight we are in our kitchens at number eight, Norrisley, and number eight, Raven Clothes. And we are going to show you hands on how to get your kitchens ready for Pesach. Thank you, thank you, Rabbi Freeman. So, Rabbi Freeman will give um, hands on guidance about your uh, appliances, your oven, your microwave, your stove tops. And I'll be actually cash koshering my sink, uh, some utensils here. We'll show you how to do it. We're going to show you the inside of my cupboard. This is the one day a year when I, I'm a comfortable zooming in the kitchen because the kitchen's actually tidy, spotlessly tidy, and we'll talk about that later. So thank you for joining, and over to you, Rabbi Friedman. Thank you, Rabbi Griffintag. Okay, so my part of the evening is we're going to go through various appliances in your kitchen. Now, I want to encourage everyone, please do post your questions you might have, anything we don't address this evening. We can see your questions on Facebook Live, and we'll try to address as many as we can and as many details as we can. So I've lined up all of the appliances in my kitchen, and we'll walk through them one by one. Uh, thank you, Edward, who is in the background uh, putting this all together. Uh, on the video here in the kitchen is Rabbi Nitt. Thank you. And Rabbi Nitt, I'm actually going to need at one point, I've forgotten the blech, uh, so we're going to have to line up the blech as well. But we're going to start, I'm going to do it in no particular order other than the order that I set them up in, which was random. I thought I was just supposed to get the salt. <laughs> That's right. Okay. And so what I'm going to be doing is really based on the work of Pnei Halacha by Rabbi Eliezer Mulamed. So I will tell you some of the things that Rabbi Mulamed says. Well, he tends to be to err on the side of leniency. I will tell you some of the things that we do in our home and that Rabbi Muhammad would say that they're completely fine to do. And then everybody makes up their own mind when it comes to their Pesach practices. So let's begin here with our microwave. You can, you'll notice as you uh, look around our kitchen, we've got a bit of a red seam going. So the way to kasha a microwave, and kasha in a microwave, I will tell you, uh, there was a time that um, many of the post game were a little hesitant. I would say pretty much across the board today, uh, there is a, a, um, an acceptance that microwaves are kosherable for Pesach as for year round. And the way that we do it, so let's open up our microwave. Now, strictly speaking, really the tray is a little more complicated. And if you really must kosher the glass tray, the way to do it, it will be to put it in boiling water like Rabbi Kuntag will show you later. Although it is preferable, if you can avoid not kashering it for Pesach, for doing it year round, if you had a mix up between meat and milk, that would be okay. For Pesach, ideally, one should simply remove the glass tray. Well, but you have to be careful with that you don't break it, that it doesn't break in, when you're boiling. That's right, that's right, that's right. But we'll get to boiling with Rabbi Kuntag. Um, I might actually be easier for you if you just put the, um, All right, so what we do to cut your microwave is take a uh, disposable cup. I know that not everybody's excited about disposable, and if that does bother you, then the way to do it is to cut a cup, the way Rabbi Guttentag will show you a little later, and to use one of those cushioned cups. So it's, it's already Pesach dick, but it hasn't been used for anything. Place it inside, fill it up almost all the way. You're going to place it in your microwave and turn on your microwave to full blast for five minutes. That will boil the cup over. And essentially the way microwaves work is that it works with the moisture in the food. So you're not actually going to feel much heat in the walls, but it gets to the same point, and I couldn't have, we'll talk a little later about the idea of kabolo kakolto, the same way that something becomes chametzik or becomes trace is the same way that we need to remove it. So the moisture that was in any food went into the walls of the microwave. By boiling up that cup of water, we're going to release any chametz in the walls. We don't see it, of course, because it's 
smaller than, or not really visible to the eye. It's some kind of what we call bleos, absorptions, and then that will be removed. It will all be kosher. We throw out our water, and the microwave is good to go. Kosher for Pesach, Meltic or Fleshic, it is now parav and like new. Let's move on to our toast. So how do you kosher a toaster for Pesach? Now, my guess is there isn't really, I mean, I tried this, and I don't see it's quite yeah. useful. Um, your toaster on Pesach. So let's skip that one because, you know, put your toaster away for Pesach. We don't need that. I would say the same thing as well for the sandwich maker. Not going to do very well putting your matzah in the sandwich maker. Take it away for Pesach. Not need it. All right. That's easy. Whether There's like three appliances down. Let's move on to our challenge pot, right? Otherwise known as a slow cook. Really, the challenge pot is um, complicated. You can't really kasha the chalent pot for Pesach. Reason being that we can kasha metal, we can kasha glass, we can kasha plastic, depending on uh, which opinion we go with. But what we cannot kasha is um, ceramic. Now, this pot in here um, is a ceramic pot, and that makes it a problem. Ceramic is too absorbable. Um, everything that gets absorbed into the ceramic cannot be released, and therefore we cannot kasha it. If you have an insert in your chalent pot uh, or in your slow cooker that is metal, and when I say metal, it's without any Teflon coating, they're, they're problematic as well, that also absorbs, then you could kasha it. And the way that you would kasha it is um, you would fill it up with water all the way to the top and turn it on high and let it boil over and that would kasha the pot you don't want to leave it too long boiling over of course because it's going to go into the elements and just enough to let it boil over watch it and then and then it's it's good to go it's kashered um the way to kash the lid would be when rabbi couldn't talk shows you later the boil um boiling up a boiling pot Use that boiling pot to crush a bit of the chalent if you did have a metal insert. Of course, there is another way to do it if you didn't have a metal insert, would be to completely cover the ceramic pot with, with aluminium foil, tin foil. That might work, but probably easiest for your chalent on the Shabbos of Pesach. Of course, you don't need it on Yom Tov, because on Yom Tov you're allowed to cook. But for the Shabbos of Pesach, and then this year, if the Shabbos the day before Pesach as well, probably easiest just to take a regular pot and leave it on the stove top, uh, which is what we used to do in the olden days, before the days of slow cooks. Right, moving along in our appliances, here we have a blender. Now, blenders tend to be complicated in terms of pushering, and we will cushion them year round, but we tend not to, we t many people tend to avoid cushioning blenders for Pesach. The problem is that there are too many small parts, and the same thing is going to go for our mixer. There are too many small parts in blenders and mixers where chametz might have been caught up. Now, the difference between year round and Pesach is that year round, if we're cushioning between meat and milk, let's say I used my a uh, blender for a smoothie that w had yogurt in. And now I want to make a smoothie that's completely hard, so I want to kasher it. I can kasher it because even if there's a minute amount of milk yogurt left somewhere in, you know, somewhere, something down here, and I missed it un underneath, it's not the end of the world because if you recall, when it comes to mixtures of meat and milk, if it's less than 1 60th, it's as if it does not exist. It's completely nullified, completely negated. So I don't need to be obsessive about it because, you know, as best as I can. When it comes to Pesach, Pesach, chametz are filled with mashur. Even the my, most minute amount of chametz on Pesach would be problematic. And so any appliances where we're concerned that there might be places that the chametz reached, we generally avoid kashering, although, so I say that generally, 
Having said that, once again, now she goes through Rabbi Malamud, a well-respected person in Israel. Rabbi Malamud says that if you feel confident that you have kashered, that you have found every little piece by taking it apart and cleaning it well and any part where any hummus could have entered, that you completely made sure that it's all gone, then what would, you would do is once it's all gone, you would kasher it the way that Rabbi Gutenberg is going to show you later with the boiling water, each part, either dipping it in the boiling water or pouring boiling water over it. Now, before we move on, we have, of course, our dishwasher. Now, I would say the dishwashers have kind of had a halachic journey. Back in the day, a decade or two ago, when dishwashers were less common, it seemed that Poiskim tended to not look so favorably upon cushioning dishwashers to face up. Even year round, uh, there were different ways of doing it in terms of looking at the racks or what kind of uh, materials it was made of. But as opposed to the dishwashers of a couple of decades ago, where we had porcelain and we had issues of uh, ceramic, most dishwashers nowadays, we're talking metal and plastic, they can be cushioned. And where chametz might be caught up is in the chomper at the bottom where the food goes. But nowadays, if you were to uh, use soap in, in that, uh, in your, do a rinse through with soap, that would make, for the most part, the, um, any food leftovers even inedible to a dog. And that is what qualifies as, as no longer chametz. What we do in the hotels, I have supervised the hotel a couple of times for Pesach, is we use lime away. Now, I'm not sure that that would work in your average dishwasher, but you want to use a strong substance that's going to really clean everything. You want to put your dishwasher at the highest temperature. I, I want to, again, emphasize that not everybody will cash your dishwasher for Pesach, but if it's something that you feel is, is necessary, of course, we don't use our dishwasher on Yom Tov. There are ways to use the dishwasher on Yom Tov if it is um, done by, turned on by a non-Jew. But we have to be careful that we don't personally turn, turn on the dishwasher. Even on a timer, it could be problematic. Reason is because, for the most part, it won't work until you close the door. So by you closing the door, is actually activating it, albeit, you know, even in an hour or two's time. But... If we want our dishwasher, at least for Cholomoyed, and we have a, a, a whole week of Cholomoyed this week, the intermediate, the intermediate days, then there are ways to kasher it. And the way to do it, Rabbi Muhammad and, and many other halakhic authorities would say, put a, put a good, strong, or even a couple of um, um, dishwashing detergents in there, turn it to its highest temperature for the longest running cycle, and you are good to go. It is... Uh, you can use that on, on paper. Any questions? You have questions? No, ask. Okay. Um, remember, if you have questions, I can't see the questions right now. When Rabbi Guttentag is on, I'm going to be able to monitor the questions. Um, I see Rabbi Nitz also checking for any questions. If you do have questions, please do post them, and we will do our very best to address them. Moving along to our oven and soap. The way to cash the oven is now some of you will have self-cleaning ovens. Self-cleaning ovens are, to quote a colleague of mine, a rabbi's best friend. The reason is a self-cleaning oven takes the temperature uh, in the oven to a thousand degrees, hotter than the, the hottest level in the oven, which is you know, no more than 500 degrees. It takes it to a thousand degrees, <laughs> burns out everything. It's what we call live on gomor. It's like taking a blowtorch to to your oven and would completely kasher it. If you put on your self-cleaning cycle, often a two or three hour cycle, then according to all opinions, bar none, it is completely kosher, the Pesach, and you could kasher it from milchiks to fleshiks using the self-cleaning cycle. Everybody agrees with that. Everyone's in unison. Nobody says that that's a leniency today, right? It used to be sometimes people would change their ovens but that was in the days before self-cleaning. Self-cleaning does it all because, again, we're making it hotter than it's ever been in the past. 
Now, we don't have a self cleaning oven, so we rely on the next best thing, what we used to, what everyone would have before the self clean, which is to turn the oven. Okay, here's a couple of things. One thing I, I, I neglected to mention with all of our pieces that Rabbi Guntag will also emphasize time and again is the rule of Me'es Le'es, 24 hour rule. Before we kasher anything, we're going to wait 24 hours because biblically, after that 24 hour period, it's what we call pogum. It's no longer any absorbed taste that would be released would no longer be taste tasty. And so biblically, it wouldn't be a problem. So we wait for that biblical time lapse and then we kasher. So before kashering our oven and, and stove, we wait for an hour, sorry, we wait for 24 hours. Then we take the oven, make sure your racks are inside, all of your racks. You're going to turn it on to full blast, the highest temperature, the highest setting. You know which one that is? Uh, yes, on this one, that's, that's a good question. On this one, it would be the full convection cycle. This is an oven that has both um, regular and convection. The convection is going to get hotter, and so you would put it on full convection cycle for an hour, and that will pressure it. And good to go. make sure it's clean first. Actually, I should won't point that out. On the self-cleaning oven, you don't have to clean it first. Sometimes you you might want to clean it afterwards. You see, there's a little um, there are ashes left over from any particles of food. But if it's not a self-cleaning oven, you need to make sure that it's completely spotless before, and then you wait 24 hours, and then you're good to go if you turn it on for an hour. Stove tops? We just cook. <laughs> stove tops. Um, stove tops, make sure that all of the area is clean. Now, there are differences when it comes to different stove tops. What you have basically for um, a, um, a gas stove top like this is some people will cover each piece with tinfoil, not strictly necessary, more necessary when you have other electric stove tops um, that where they're not or not all the pieces are being covered by the flame. Here it's sufficient to turn it up each knob for half an hour. Now it's important this is not a halakhic issue, it's just a practical issue. Don't do them all at once, especially if you have your knobs on top, especially if they're, if they're plastic knobs. If you put all of the um, range uh, pieces on at the same time, you will melt um, the area around. So do them one by one, turn each one on for half an hour. You could even do alt um, diagonally alternate, and that way you will pressure all of them. Again, it has to be clean before, left for 24 hours, and then turned on for the half for the half hour. How high do you have to show? Maybe sample it out to show. Is it right, me so medium, medium? No, so again, we want to go to the highest setting, highest highest setting, setting that it goes, and you want to do that for the half hour. Okay. Right? You don't want it on low, you want it on the highest for half an hour. Okay. Uh, let's move on to some of the other uh, here. We have Rabbi Kuntag is going to address hoods um, okay. when in this um, segment. And we have some coffee uh, bits and pieces that I often get asked about. First one is your kettle. Uh, your kettle, a lot of us don't really wash the kettle. If you're not washing the kettle with your non, with your comments items, the gold that you use it for is boiling water and it's never come near anything comments stick, then it's fine. It's fine for Pesach. Some people like to boil it over just in case, but really, strictly speaking, um, it, it's fine. What about if you have a, one from the sink? You know how you have automatic boiling, like a spout? Yes. Yeah, so then what you want to do is just make sure when Rabbi Guttentag um, is looking at cashing the sink area, you would cash at that area as well with your boiling water. Um, coffee maker, again, uh, we can do use this only during Holomoy, not on Shabbat and Yomtev itself, but an electric piece. But if the only pods in this case that you put in are non-flavored pods, so straight up coffee, which is what we use, then it's fine to pace up because no comet has ever entered it. Now if you're using flavored pods, it's a problem and there's not a lot of ways you can to pace up because you would be passing through um you would be 
um, the water would pass through, but it wouldn't necessarily capture everything. So you might have to leave it for Pesach if you've been using flavored pods that are not fresh for Pesach. But if you do have specific questions about various coffee type machines, please do contact me directly and we can talk about whether it would work and whether, because every coffee machine is a little different, works a little differently. Nothing is completely off limits. Sometimes, and many of you will know, I've asked you, send me pictures, let me see how it's working, and then I can make a determination as to whether it's kosherable or not. What if the next few days I just use the plain coffee? Can I kosher it? Yeah, so it, it might work. That might work because I can be, um, kosher it through with a cycle possible. All right, so as I say, we would have to see each one. Here we have our um, frother. And the frother, what I would do, again, we haven't used the, I should I, let me take that back. I was going to say we haven't used it for anything non commerce but it's not true. We have used it for soy. Now, soy milk for Ashkenazim is, according to most opinions, kidney art. And so what I would have to do, I tried earlier putting water in this and turning it on, but it doesn't get that hot. It doesn't get to a boil. So the way you would have to do it is to uh, pour boiling water over it in order to pressure it and dip the piece into the boiling water. I would say the same thing as well. I'm sure this has a technical name in our family called this the Zhuzha, um, that kind of predates the frother. I like using both of them. It's called a frother, <laughs> milk frother. This is also called milk frother. Okay. Hand, 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 hand. Handheld milk frother. Okay, so for this, um, dip it in boiling water and um, it will be fine. The, the issue with this is sometimes people might drop it into the sink and it could come into contact with a comments item. Uh, and then we so have... So you can't use it on it? it? No, no, we just want to be able to make sure that we're touching it by pouring boiling water. And, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and then we have our urn. Now the urn, again, presumably you've only used it for water. Some people will boil it up to the top and, and over. Not necessary. If you haven't had any comments that you've dropped into it, then all you need to do is you know, to make sure it's clean around the outside and it is good to use for pesa. It is partial pesa. And finally, uh, we look at our bleth. Now, the bleth is the object that we use to keep food warm on Shabbos and Yamto. Some call it today a platter or an electric hot plate, and this is what we're talking about. So what you should do for your blast is make sure it's completely clean, and then you haven't used it for 24 hours, turn it up to full blast just for an hour, and you're good to go. Some people will cover it. It's not absolutely necessary. The reason is, uh, well, here's what you need to know. Don't put food directly onto it on Pesach. Uh, even if year round, maybe you do, don't do it on Pesach. And then the rule is if you don't have any food that actually comes into contact with it, it's just simply a dry pot or a dry pan that you're putting onto this dry surface, then there is no transferability between any absorbed comets and the pot or pan itself. Uh, and so as long as it's clean, it's been kashered, you are good to go. Well, that's it for my segment. Uh, I hope uh, that's made some sense. If you have any questions or if I've left out any of the appliances, please do post them in the comments and I will uh, take a look momentarily. But meanwhile, I hand you over to Rabbi Friedman. Thank you very much, Rabbi Friedman. So welcome to our kitchen here at 8 Rayburn Close. So I'm going to show you some of the practical things of how to kosher um, Kalim utensils. So the first thing I'm going to show you is a Becher, right? So many of you will want, on Seder night, you're going to want to use your goblet, your Becher, your Kush, whatever you call it. So you get a pot, I'm going to hold the camera here, hope you can see. Right, as you can see, it's bubbling away. And you simply get the cup dunk it in. Okay, you dunk it in. Very hot. 
and then you pull it out with the I should be wearing gloves but I left them in shoe there you go there you go okay so then you pull it out and this cup is now kosher for Passover that's what you do okay hence the uh you see then oh they it's hot okay now what if you've got things which are smaller so i'm going to show you now uh let's say you want to do some cutlery right you've got knife fork fork spoon get a pillowcase put it in the pillowcase and then the pillowcase you put that in the water okay not the one that you're going to be using tonight for sleeping you put it in now you'll notice once the because the cutlery is actually cold it will stop the water from bubbling so you leave it in until the water starts bubbling again and then you pull it up now it's bubbling and the cutlery that you put in is now good okay so it's really very simple you find the biggest pot you've got at home the biggest pot you've got and that's what you use because oh my daughter's just a big artist brought me my gloves put my gloves on now we take health and safety very seriously here okay so if you've got heat proof gloves that's the best put them on <clears throat> Um, so let's say now you want to do a tray. So the key thing that one, one has to understand here is that the, it's got to be absolutely, completely clean. Okay? It's got to be completely clean. And as Rabbi Friedman mentioned, it's got to be a night ben yemen. I mean, they haven't been used for 24 hours. Now, I want to kosher this tray, but the problem is, if I put this tray in my kashering pot, as you'll see, it doesn't quite fit. A lot of it sticks out, but that is absolutely fine because this is not like Tavira's Kaili. When you buy a new Kaili, you've got to submerge the whole Kaili into a mikvah. But when it comes to kashering, it doesn't have to all be completely submerged at the same time. So even though some of it is sticking out, that's not a problem. You pull it out, turn it around, and you do the next part. Okay, so it doesn't all have to be at the same time. So that is how one caches KD. It's really, really very simple. Uh, one thing I must add about the, the Befa, for example, um, well, if, it's a, if it's the kind that's got grooves on it, you've got to make sure there's no grime or muck or crumbs inside uh, the grooves. So it's got to be completely clean, not used for 24 hours. You dunk it in and you are done. Now I'm going to show you now how I'm, going to, I'm actually, and this is real life, right, so there's my sink, and we want to use this sink, of course, for Pesach. So I've got two kettles here boiling, as you can see, and I must warn you, you're going to need a lot of towels. I've learned the hard way to put towels over there, otherwise the water drips into the cupboards. I've got some spares going over there. Right, we're all ready. And then what you do, so this is bubbling away. camera back over there you then open the spout and you hold it over the sink and you let the water drip on all areas of the sink okay over the faucet as well over the tap over the knobs Every single area and the draining board as well, completely have the water poured over it. Okay, so once you done, goes the tap. Now it's important to note that, you see the steam coming off there? Boiling hot. My sink is now kosher for Passover. Uh, now it's important to know, uh, one very important um, bit of knowledge one has to have 
is that you don't just pour a bit of water at the top and let the water drain down. Every part of the sink has to have the, the actual the boiling water go over it. So you don't just put a bit at the top and let it drain down. You let it you hold it over it and let the hot water drip directly. It's called irroclearition iru, directly on each part of the sink. And you can do the countertops as well. Uh, most countertops these days are made of marble or granite, which is absolutely fine to kosher. You just open the tap, let it drip over it, like that, and every single part of it, and you are good to go. Now, if you don't want to do that, other options are available. For example, you can just cover your side. So here we've got, as you can see, it's, it's a vinyl tablecloth. You put it on, it's got to be taped completely, and that's how it's done. Now, when it comes to Pesach cleaning, oh, but these, this is our photo collection, by the way. Remember those days we used to have simchas? The photo booths, so we've collected those, but it hasn't grown in the past year. Um, so when it comes to Pesach cleaning, so generally there's a halakhic rule of bottled bashishim, that if you, for example, accidentally spill a drop of milk in your chicken soup, if it's less than 60, and if it was an accident, you're good to go. And if you're not sure, call the rabbi, that's what rabbis are here for. But when it comes to chametz, the rule is, it's not nullified one in 60. Uh, the halach, and uh, the shulchan aruch says, feed a bit like bottle, that even one in a thousand does not nullify it. If you've got one tiny crumb, one tiny crumb of chametz of bread falls into your Pesach chicken soup, the whole pot is invalid. You can't use it on Pesach. So that's why it's particularly important that all your Pesach cleaning efforts should go into the kitchen. As my rabbi told me that, you know, when it comes to Pesach cleaning, 10% of your efforts should go around the house. Make sure you've got your chametz around the house. But 90% of, of your efforts should go in the kitchen. So, you, like I said, you can either cover the surface is like that, or you can kosher it if you'd rather leave it uncovered. Now also when it comes to your cupboard, so this particular cupboard, I'm showing you our cupboard over here, and I've put a bit of tape over there. The reason I put tape over there, because inside this cupboard there's no actual chomet. It's, it's spices and, and uh, sugar, the stuff that we use during the whole year. But during Pesach we're not going to use it, so we've, we've locked that cupboard off. It doesn't even have to be cleaned. And when you sign your sale of comments to the rabbi, that cupboard will be included in the sale of comments. But you must lock it away to know, especially when it comes to your spice cupboard, because when you're cooking, you might naturally, you know what, you know what it's like, you naturally open that cupboard to get your paprika, to get your chili spice, whatever, your salt, your pepper, and you put it in your food. And that could be problematic. If it's a cupboard that you would decide you're going to use for Pesach, so it's got to be cleaned properly, and then you line it, right? You clean it properly, you put some sheets over it, and that way it will be completely covered. So none of your Pesach food will have any uh, opportunity to come in contact with Hamut. Um So in your kitchen, you have one has to know. So this cupboard, for example, we're going to be using for Pesach. So as you can see, it's lined. Pesach products in there cupboard we're not using, we've locked up, etc, etc. Here's another cupboard that we've done, the pass of all the Pesach cereals and the Mapsa, and that all goes <clears throat> in there and that's okay. So basically any surface that you're going to be using on Pesach has to be completely, completely clean, not one crumb must remain. But I just want to finish with a, um, a homolytical message from the practical halakhas of Pashtari. Uh, as Rabbi Friedman mentioned, Kabul or Kachpolta, that um, as hot as it was to absorb the chomets, you've got to make it even hotter to open the pores and release the chomets. So basically, what this halach is teaching us is that as much as goes in, that's hot, you've got to get it for it to go out. And this is, you can look at this metaphorically for life itself. Right? The more you put into something, the more you'll get out. Many people will tell me, um, you know, I'm not really getting much out of shul service, I'm not getting much out of Yiddishkeit, I'm not getting much out of this, much out of the other, etc. And the question one really has to ask oneself, 
how much are you putting in? Because in Yiddish kind, and really in everything in life, the more you put in, the more you get out. And that's why we let it bubble away. Right? We let the pot bubble away. We let the kettles bubble away and we pour it over the sink because we make it hotter than it was to make it non comet to make it comet, make it even hotter to make it non comet and I think that is a very powerful lesson for all of us. And like I say, most countertops are kosherable, if it's granite or marble, etc. China, for example, cannot be kosher. China is considered earthenware, which a lot of considers unkosherable. Is that a word? Unkosherable. Uh, but again, if you've got any questions, uh, myself and Rabbi Friedman are available. Call, text, WhatsApp, Facebook Live, FaceTime, wherever you want. Uh, do give us a call. Thank you all for joining us. I wish you all Chag Shemeach. Have a wonderful and kosher Pesach. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Friedman. Any questions whatsoever? Sorry? You're in the show. Thank you, everybody. And thank you again to Edward. And thank you, Edward, whose idea was it? Yes, Edward in the background is uh, doing all the magical camera work, and uh, it worked. So thank you very much, Edward. Again, I hope we covered everything. If you, if you think we've missed anything out, if you've got any questions, do call Rabbi Friedman or myself, and we'd be happy to speak to you or text you. Thanks, Samir.